so I've been watching this show. Uh, you know, I watched uh, I watched the majority of Rings of Power. I will admit, I did not finish Rings of Power. And the reason why is that um, I was watching it with my dad, and like my dad was unable to watch the show without falling asleep, like physically incapable of watching the show without falling asleep and like by the way yeah he's an old man right but like if we're watching a, a war movie or something about like something where he can tell me what that like he can talk to me about like how much he knows more than the movie right he's gonna be talking to me during the movie and i find i fucking hate that but he does it and uh anyway but yeah, with this, like, I'm pretty sure, like, even at the the starting screen, he had passed the fuck out. But it never bothered, Rings of Power never bothered me. And the reason why it didn't is that I just view it as fan fiction. It's just fan fiction. It's just it, yeah. It's the same as, like, that uh, Shadow of Mordor, like, oh, you can make a blue one ring? No? Like, what the fuck? Like, yeah, like, I didn't give a shit about that. Hey kid, are you interested in a story about an overpowered elf girl who, yeah. after a tragic loss, travels through a fantasy realm to fight evil alongside diverse mm -hmm. quirky characters? If you thought I was talking about the Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power, you'd be wrong. Mm -hmm. Let's face it, the Rings of Power had a chance. To be fair though, like the Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power. The one thing you'd that be we wrong. did get. Let's face it, we got a few really fucking badass scenes. This is one of them. This was fucking awesome. The Rings of Power had a chance to be a good show, but ultimately failed to capture the whimsical nature of Tolkien's yeah, work. Numenor was Luckily, Freerin, beyond Journey's End, or so so no Freerin, is everything the Rings of Power wishes it could be. Yeah, it sure and does is. more justice to Tolkien's work without even using the same name mm -hmm. or characters. But what I found most interesting is the surprising similarities between Freerin and Galadriel, as they both share similar character traits, motivations, and even some of the same flaws. Of course, just having those traits doesn't necessarily make a character well written. Sure. I know there are a ton of YouTubers who already ragged on Galadriel, calling her a Mary Sue, and even speculating that she may in fact be Sauron in disguise. So it's great to have Freeran as an insane. example of how you could make a likable Galadriel. I highly recommend you watch at least episode 1 of Sauce No Freeran for context. It's only around 20 minutes long and you will pretty much get everything you need to know about the story and the character. And while I'm not planning to spoil anything that you wouldn't find in the synopsis, it may lessen the impact of your initial viewing experience. For fairness, I guess you can- Yeah, I watched, uh, I'm up to the episode on Freerin, uh, where the fuck? It's where, like, the guy gets the girl uh, a birthday present, she gets mad at him because he didn't get her one in time. Like, yeah, 14 or 15, something like that. Yeah, like, I'm, I'm pretty far into it. Watch the first episode of Rings of Power 2. Yeah. Also, I gotta be honest with you, whatever character analysis I do in Galadriel may not even be accurate. Mm -hmm. Since her character is so one-dimensional, I'm afraid I might make her sound too complex and interesting than she actually is. With all that out of the way, <laughs> let's start. Both Freerin and Galadriel set off on their adventure after the death of a loved one. Yep. For Galadriel, it was her older brother Finrod. And for Freerin, it was her friend and fellow adventurer Himmel. Both mm -hmm. shows make it pretty clear that those deaths had a massive impact on the protagonists and kickstarted the whole story. So I think, I think one reason why Freerin is better and it's better written is that there are a lot more things in the show that aren't outwardly stated. Like one problem that I think a lot of uh, like Western shows have now is that there are there's never any subtlety in any of the like any sort of media. There's never any subtlety. Everything is so outward and like overt. And like you can even compare this, it's spoon fed, right? Yeah, it is. You can even compare this to like older movies that like it's not like that anymore. Media literacy is dead. I, I don't know really why. I mean, it could be like a bunch of different reasons, but yeah, I think that's true. It's important to take a look specifically at how those tragic events are presented to the audience. After all, mm -hmm. if the viewers are to stick around for the journey, they have to be empathetic to the goals of the protagonists. Yeah. To make the death of a loved one impactful, a writer has to make them likable or at least establish a strong bond between them and the protagonist. There it is. The stronger the bond, the more tragic the loss is to both mm -hmm. the protagonist and the viewer. Most writers know this, so they spend time building up the loved one in the story. There are a ton of great examples. So let's see how the Rings of Power and Sosa no Freerun handled this trope. In the Rings of Power, we get to see Galadriel's childhood and Finrod's role in it. Finrod appears to be a caring older brother and a mentor to Galadriel. Yeah, sure. At least that's what I think the show is trying to establish. The lesson Finrod teaches doesn't really make sense. The stone sees only downward. 
And also, like, one thing that annoyed me about this is that... Think about how badass it would have been if you actually got the scene of Ungoliant and Melkor, and Ungoliant actually, like, draining the life out of the trees of Valinor. And we didn't get that. Why the fuck not? That would have been awesome. It would be insane. Yeah, it would be super cool. Darkness of the water is vast and irresistible. I think Probably the writer budget. is trying to make the scene appear more deep and profound, mm -hmm. but lacks the wisdom to actually make it profound. The worst thing is that having Galadriel and Finrod just sitting around talking in a monotonous voice doesn't help establish a strong familial bond. Not only is it visually boring, it makes their relationship appear cold and distant. But you must learn to discern them for yourself. I won't always be here to speak them to you. You right? I'm just as confused as Galadriel. Why would Finrod say that? I hope he's not implying that he will die, because the show establishes that death isn't even a concept among the elves yeah. at this point. We had no word for death, for we thought our joys would be unending. So technically, you could always be around. Yeah, then exactly. again, I'm not sure he wants to. There's nothing to indicate that they actually like each other. <laughs> when he tells her to come home with him, Galadriel just stands there and watches him go alone. Why? I don't get it. I thought they were meant to have a close relationship. Why couldn't you have- Well, I think it's just all like trying to like make it foreshadowing for the fact that he's gonna die, right? It's like, again, like there's the lack of subtlety. Them walk together, hold hands maybe, maybe have her looking up at him while they walk next to each other. Mm -hmm. Anything to show the two are actually close. Look, I know what the show is trying to symbolize with Finrod leaving her alone, but it wasn't earned yet. Yeah. Which is why I doubt anyone in the audience felt sad when Finrod went to war or when he was killed. We didn't even see him say goodbye to Galadriel before going to war. Mm -hmm. We don't even see anyone mourn his death besides Galadriel. And even she barely mustered out a tear. One could argue that these elves still don't quite understand the concept of death, but I'd argue it would be a good time to show them emotional and vulnerable. For such an important plot beat, the Rings of Power utterly fail to signify the importance of Finrod and the tragedy of his death. The well, I mean, like, the big comparison there is the fact that, like, in Freerin, like, you hear about this guy at, like, the beginning of the show, and then he's gone. Whereas, like, in Freerin, there's a lot of, like, they keep building up, like, the past storyline, like, very much throughout the entire show, rather than it just kind of being, like, the springboard of the actual story. So it is one hour long. Could they not have squeezed in a few scenes of Finrod and Galadriel doing something fun together? Or show the moment Galadriel hears about her brother's death? Galadriel is an adult by the time Finrod dies. Could we not have had a scene where Galadriel shows concern about Finrod going to a never war campaign? His death could have been a warning to Galadriel about the dangers That's of vengeful- That's a very good point. That like, yeah, it's like all this stuff is just totally skipped and ignored. Obsessions. There are so many ways of making this good and they use none of them. But no, Finor was nothing more than a plot device that justified Galadriel's insane actions throughout the show. Anyway, let's see how Freerin's relationship with Himmel is handled in So So No Freerin. Unlike The Rings of Power, So So No Freerin uses a lot of visual storytelling. You can basically watch the show on mute or without subs and still yeah. follow the story pretty well. And the show That's uses true. this to great effect to establish relationships and signified narrative changes. Just look at the first interaction between Freerin and Himmel. Freerin's face is covered by the book like a wall between her and the rest of the world. Himmel calls her by her name, making her drop that wall. Look at the framing of the shot and how Freerin enters it. She could have been sitting in that shot already, but no, she raises into the frame, almost like she was in her own world until now. Despite there being four characters, Freerin, Himmel, Heiter, and Eisen, Freerin is almost always in frame next to Himmel, signifying Himmel's importance in Freerin's life especially compared to the other two party members. The dialogue, too, doesn't waste time to establish who they are, their relationship. Well, it's e also like, I mean, even like the entire timekeeping of the show is around the frame of reference of this guy, right? And so, whereas like, I forgot uh, Gladriel's, uh, what do you call it? I, I forgot her brother's name. Like, by the time I was on episode three, I already forgot his name. Because who cares? Even some future events. It feels like a natural conversation that already gives plenty of information for the audience mm -hmm. to get a feel for each character. Much like Galadriel, Freerin has that elfish stoicism and appears detached from the other party members. Elves in this anime live for thousands of years, so Freerin perceives the passage of time differently than her human or dwarf companions. 
So there's a good reason why Himmel also says something along the lines of I won't always be around, but in a much more subtle way. Free Ren, the life that lies ahead of you will be far longer than the rest of us could know or that we could begin to comprehend. Yes, perhaps. And it works better than the Rings of Power because it's a human telling this to an elf. Now, if this was Rings of Power, this would be the last time we see Himmel. Maybe we see him die in battle and yeah, then sure. standing at his grave. But no, this is Soso no Freerin, and it's not done making you fall in love with these characters. We have them celebrate together, reminisce over their adventure with flashbacks. We repeatedly told her it was well, a trap. And it's also like, again, it's something that, that goes throughout the entire show. Like, or at least as far as I've gotten in the show. Like, it's not something that's like, it's a one and done, and then like, there's the new story that follows that. The dub? Yeah, well, I mean, I think people, I mean, nobody wants, not everybody wants to read subtitles. Like, I get that. I mean, sometimes I watch shows on dub too. I mean, like, I'm going to be totally honest. I do. Like, I don't speak Japanese. I don't want to listen to something in Japanese. Happened yet. Here we are. I'm Is it time to lose the elf? The scene once again highlights the difference in perception of time between Freerin and her friends. You made this quest the journey of my lifetime. Thank you all. I feel the same way. Our adventure was a mere ten years. Uh, a mere 10? But that's a full decade. Freerin doesn't have the same sentimental notions that they do, mm -hmm. but Himmel and the others are understanding. Watch how Himmel reacts when Freerin offers to take them to a special place to watch the meteor shower again. I know a good place. I'll take us there when the opportunity arises in 50 years. <laughs> What's wrong? Nothing. Nothing in the world. See, again... It's like it, there's the subtleties that exist in this show that in a lot of modern shows don't exist. They're just not there. So it's a plan. They extremely lack it, years yeah. from now. He doesn't tell her that he may not live that long. He just mm -hmm. chuckles and agrees. Yeah. So now you're probably thinking, oh, I see. They made a promise to go together. She leaves for 50 years, but when she comes back, she finds out that Himmel was killed by an evil demon. Mm -hmm. So she sets off an adventure to avenge him, right? No. Nope. He's alive and well. He's just old. Mm -hmm. Too old to go to see the meteor shower causing conflict. They all meet up and go see the meteor shower. Huh. Now I got you. On their journey, a demon attacks and kills her party, setting her nope. on a revenge quest. They all successfully reach the location and enjoy the meteor shower. Damn. Unlike Finrod, Himmel is not just a plot device. He's a character with his own identity and one that is easy to like. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'd argue that we as the audience begin to appreciate Himmel more than Freerin does. And it's only been like 14 minutes. <laughs> I don't know if you felt like this when you were watching the first episode, but the moment Freerin left, my anxiety levels were starting to rise. Throughout mm -hmm. the montage of Freerin living by herself, I couldn't help but think about Himmel. In my mind, I was like, is he alright? Is he alive? Freerin, you fool, go visit him, damn it. And there was plenty of foreshadowing. Yeah, it's again, like, uh, more more subtleties. Things where it's like you can tell the story without having to, like, overtly say, this person is sad right now, and it's like they're ignoring the other person. Like, what is this? What show is this? It's called Free Run. It's on uh, Crunchyroll. To make me feel that way. Even before they set out to see the meteor shower, there was plenty of visual storytelling mm -hmm. that made it clear what's going to happen. Yeah, this will obviously. be Himmel's final adventure. Once again, Soso no Firin takes time to showcase the importance of Himmel's death by letting the audience be part of the funeral. And it's full of well thought out visual storytelling. Yep. Like this wide shot where we see Freerin at the center with an empty space next to her. Think how many times we saw her in the same mm -hmm. shot with Himmel, but now he's not there. Unlike Galadriel, Firin understands the concept of death. She has seen plenty of it over the thousands of years that she lived, so it makes sense that she is stoic during the funeral. Some of the locals even shame her for not showing any sadness. That girl was one of Himmel's companions. I've yet to even see her frown. How heartless. But again, for an elf, a human's life is very short and insignificant. And yet... Yeah, she does cry at the end, I think. This is a cut down Ten watching years with Yeah. Him. Wasn't nearly enough time to learn. I was aware that mm. human lives are short. But this why didn't I try to 
try to better know and understand you. <laughs> yeah, this guy's my favorite, by the way. He's the best. The priest? Jeez, the Rings of Power wishes they had a scene like that. Mm -hmm. There was no need for any demons or villains to come in yeah. and kill the loved one. In all cases, the Himmel died priest, the best yeah. possible way. Peacefully, among his best friends. The real tragedy is fear and realizing too late that her friends' lives are short and that she missed out on making many great memories with them. It's a far more relatable introspection that many grieving people feel. Firin doesn't have some big bad evil guy to focus on killing to make herself feel better. She has to deal with her guilt yeah, and regret. Yeah, all, the, uh, all the, the battles in the, the story are, are, like, they're kind of like, yeah, they happen, but, like, they're really not that big of a deal. Like, it, that's really not the main point of the story. Like, there's that one uh, where, like, the, the fern is, like, fighting the, the vampire guy. That was kind of a big deal, right? But, like, besides that, nothing else really was. That right wasn't ways. Hard. Luckily, Hyter and Eisen comfort her, letting her and the audience know that she still has two friends who are there for her, and maybe she will learn to appreciate them more. <laughs> Meanwhile, I have no idea what Galadriel is thinking or feeling. I don't really know what kind of introspection she's having besides acknowledging the horrors of war and choosing to seek out vengeance against the one who killed her brother. But not before stealing the blade out of Finrod's cold dead hands. Wouldn't it have been great to see her comforted by her friends instead? Oh yeah. Does she even have friends? Does Finrod have any friends? Maybe that's why she chose to deal with grief in such a toxic way. By the way, do you know why she took Finrod's blade? It's because the writers thought it's so clever to have a blade symbolize Finrod. Look, it's like her brother is besides her, guiding her and protecting her. The writers didn't even realize they were literally objectifying Finrod. Would it not have been more meaningful if he gave her that blade, rather than her prying it out of her brother's corpse? Again, it would I don't even think that was the problem. I, I think that it's just as simple as that, like, you can't make something, like, if you want to have people, like, understand something on an emotional level, you can't just one and done it. It just doesn't work that well. And yeah, something free to show yeah, the exactly. relationship. In Freeran's case, we see her look at the ring after the funeral, implying... Yeah, I actually, I don't think that the dagger thing is really that bad, personally. Like, it wasn't, like, I think that's okay. Something she got from Himmel. It's not yet clear what the significance of the ring mm -hmm. is, but I'm sure we will find out later in the series. Himmel himself made sure that he will not be forgotten by anyone, especially Freerin. You are constantly getting statues put up in your honor, Himmel. Well, how else can I assure that people will remember us? Take a look at this face! Future generations must see how handsome I was! Whatever, I'm heading back to the inn. Though... There is a greater reason. When we three are gone, maybe our statues will keep you from feeling lonely. He also appears on flashbacks, and in the characters that Himmel helped in the past. His existence improved many lives and inspired many heroic deeds. It's a presence that never leaves Freerian's side, even if Himmel is dead. Finrod, on the other hand, uh, he has one statue, I guess, amongst yeah. other elves who died in battle. He doesn't appear exceptional in that way. And again, because we never see any more scenes between him and Galadriel, it's really hard to empathize with Galadriel's quest. So I guess the blade is better than nothing. They could still do something with it. I think it. that there's another problem where, like, a lot of these stories that... Like, I feel like this is a common complaint that a lot of people have with, like, f like female narratively driven stories, is that I, I don't think that a lot of writers, at least, like, Western writers, know how to write female characters with, like, believable flaws. I think that oftentimes they write male characters, and then they just make them female instead. And I think that's really what the issue is. Is it, like, it's there's this fundamental... Uh, like disconnect between like what would a guy do in this situation versus what would a girl do in this situation now i think that's really what the issue is it's that it's not relatable because it's not real it it could be used like luffy's hat where she gives it to someone important to her but they don't so i don't know why i'm bringing it up but you may be thinking trend we hear you these scenes are important but what about the main characters which elf girl is better? What makes them similar or different? Look, I think it's pretty obvious which character will be better written. But you're right, I did say there's a lot to compare between Galadriel and Freerun. I don't really subscribe to the idea that Galadriel is being a Mary Sue. 
While the show is definitely trying to portray Galadriel as a tough and capable warrior that is liked or feared by others, her mm -hmm. actions and dialogue make her out to be a highly flawed character. Remember when I... Here's another just reality fact. It's much more believable to have female characters as really powerful mages versus really powerful warriors. Because women are naturally weaker than men. That's just how it is. So it's just like basically just on like a very fundamental level. Like it makes a lot more sense to have a female mage be really powerful versus like a female warrior be really powerful. And it's fantasy. But it it's not though, right? It's not really fantasy. It's just like a fantastical world where humans are in it. Like they're like I think that fantasy thrives in the cracks in between the fantasy where like the humanity is there like that's why something like lord of the rings is really good that's why a lot of like really popular fantasy movies are popular it's because they're fantasy but because they're telling a story in a fantastical way they it, it like kind of gives them in a weird like abstract sense the ability to tell a very human story because everything else in the story is kind of like uh like you're, you're not believing in that Right? You know that's not real. And so the human element is the only thing that is real. Uh, I probably could say that in a better way, but like that's generally what I'm trying to say. Witcher 3 has that. It's really good. Especially the in intelligence and, and maturity of a mage. It works well with the portrayal of both younger and older women in fantasy. Yeah, it does. That's just how it is. Couldn't they be more agility melee fighter? Not power powerful, but flexibility and dexterous? Yeah, maybe, but, like, come on, man. Like, what are we talking about? Like, like, <laughs> Arya Stark, yeah, that works, but it doesn't work as well as her just being a fucking mage. It's just still not real. I mentioned Elvin's traditionalist, traditionalist take. It's not, somebody says a traditionalist take. Yes. It's, it, there is no, there is no other take to have. That's it. There's no other take that. There's not another viewpoint that you can have. That's just that's just the reality. And, it, and what I'm saying is that it doesn't... It, like, clearly breaks the boundaries. Like, you have to... Let me think of a way to put it. Like, I, I don't know how to explain it in, like, a good way. But basically, in a weird way, it's more believable that there are mages than that there's like some girl that's like able to like overpower five knights at the same time that are men. It's a suspension of disbelief. Yeah, I, I, I can't explain it. It just feels weird to me. Um, yeah, Galadriel struggles with yeah. that one. In many scenes, we see her barely holding her emotions in. She always looks like she's about to snap. Mm -hmm. You know you're in trouble when Sauron tells you to keep it calm. Show some restraint. Let's try not to antagonize these people. Then if blood be the price of passage, I will pay it. But one way or another, I will depart. If she had Darth Vader's force choke abilities, mm -hmm. her arm would get tired from using it too much. <laughs> the only time I remember seeing her happy is when she's riding that horse. And it's such a brief moment that the filmmakers decided to slow-mo that scene, just to have a longer take of her smiling. The rest of the time she's arguing, mm -hmm. whining about her trauma, glaring at people, or standing around like an idiot. Look at this scene where the volcano is erupting and molten rocks are falling on the villagers. Oh. Um, Galadriel, why are you standing there? Rocks are falling, people are dying. Yeah. Aren't you going to help them? Show some leadership? Hell, some self-preservation, perhaps. Uh -huh. Why are you standing there looking confused? It's not that difficult to understand what's happening. Yeah, what Go, the fuck? help them. Oh, oh, okay, okay, I'll guess you'll die. When she's not acting like an idiot, she finds a way to make herself more unlikable. Every reply she says sounds like the renegade option in a video game. I will take my chances on the skiff. That would leave me little choice but to shout for your minders. Suppose the words never manage to escape your throat. You do well to identify what it is that your opponent most fears. And exploit it. No. Surprisingly enough, I think Galadriel's likability comes out most when she's interacting with Hellbrand. I'm not gonna lie, there is a sort of chemistry between the two. It's not as strong as Fearin's and Himmel's, but it is there. <laughs> Don't tell me. Well, and also, like, isn't that kind of a problem, though? Because, like, spoilers, right? But, like, this guy's supposed to be Sauron. 
So I don't know. I think it's kind of a big deal. It's kind of a big deal. Like, yeah, I just can't seem to stop getting along with Sauron. Man. Tavern brawl. Sedition. <laughs> Much like Freeran, Galadriel struggles to relate to others, but in a slightly different way. She lacks matters and diplomacy skills, often treating others as lessers. Who is this mortal who speaks to me as if he has the slightest idea who I am? So she often makes her own mission more difficult. That's why it's nice to have Hellbrand trying to help her navigate social conventions. Yeah. So by your standards, yeah, I mean... Yeah, it's like, again, like... She's so obnoxious and unlikable in the show that she has to have Sauron. <laughs> all right, look, just calm down, all right? Look, what she's trying to say is, it's like, Jesus, man. So, because I'm yet to identify what the queen most fears. My very low standards, yes. And I suppose you did, having met her for all of a few moments. During which you managed to demand a ship, Sauron's insult her likeable. people, defy yeah, her all. Yeah, in the show, like, I would say that S Sauron is more likable than she is. That's a really good point. And it, I don't even think it's close. There's Rooting none of Sauron, which quickened yeah. her pulse. He's also the one who makes her acknowledge her own flaws and open up more. I have been searching for my peace for longer than you know. Please. For both our sakes, let me keep it. Perhaps some peace could do you good as well. There is a semblance of a good character dynamic there. Mm -hmm. However, it would be better if they were in Galadriel and Sauron. Because I don't like the idea of this Galadriel becoming the kind and caring Galadriel from the Lord of the Rings yeah, because of Sauron's guidance. it's a totally guided. different character. It just doesn't feel right. Yeah. It's not poison, if that's your concern. Not for humans, anyway. If he wasn't likable, Numenor would not attack Valinor. That's a good point. Yeah, I mean, and he is the deceiver, and yeah, he came off. But, like, the thing is that he's not even really that much of a good dude in the show either. So it's not like he's like this, you know, reigning beacon of light that everybody agrees with. No, he's an asshole kind of in the show, too. But it's like, compared to her, he's better. But, let's so be fair, yeah. Freeran also has immature qualities. But, much like the funeral scene, everything is paced out to make sure the audience actually likes Freeran mm -hmm. and relates to her despite her quirks and shortcomings. The early episodes of Soso no Freeran are all about establishing characters and the world. She's a stoic, intelligent mage who likes to collect spells. While no. appearing to be calm and collected, she's not beyond getting into trouble, being lazy, naive, or quirky. Mm -hmm. More importantly, she's quite detached from others. Well, I think this is another thing is that a lot of the shows struggle to show like uh I think that because like there's so much and this is kind of the issue with like a lot of shows is that there's so much pressure on shows to be congruent with breaking social norms and not enforcing stereotypes that the different characters that are in the shows aren't really seen to have a lot of different weaknesses. Because if they show those weaknesses, then it could be seen as a parallel to the real world. Whereas, like, Freerun does tons of dumb stuff. She's fucking lazy. She sleeps in all the time. She forgets about people's stuff. Like, everything. Yeah, she's dumb. Yeah, become unrelatable. Yeah, exactly. They're not really relatable. Freerun's basically relate to yeah, humans she's basically and their neat. sentimentality. Yeah. You didn't come to the New Year's festival with us. Why not? You broke poor Heiter's heart. Now he's bedridden. Damn. What a sensitive soul. The only thing he's sensitive to are the effects of his drink. The rest of you got to go, so what's the issue? You should have been there too. We wanted you to enjoy it. It's only after mm -hmm. Himmel's death does she begin to address her flaws. But even then, we see that it's a slow process and not one that she can overcome on her own. That's why Fern, an apprentice that Heiter left for Freer and to take care of, is such an important character in the story. Remember when I told you about my frustration with Freerin when she was wasting her time while Himmel was yeah. getting old? That's basically Fern. She's there to spur Freerin on to stop her from wasting precious time. The time I spend isn't solely my own anymore. We should go. I promise that I'll end my search soon. <laughs> Mistress. 
How many years is soon? Fern works great as the audience's POV and lets them explore Freerian's yeah. more vulnerable and relatable sides. It's something that the Rings of Power is not willing to do with Galadriel. I don't know anything about Galadriel. I only know her quest for revenge, but that's about it. She's basically Yeah, Zed. they don't want to show the character having any weaknesses or having any shortcomings or anything like that. Uh, I think that's like right now a very big problem with like a lot of this type of writing. And are from Drawn Together. Strong and woman. I yeah. am Xander. I'm on a never-ending quest to save my girlfriend. I'm on a never-ending quest to save my girlfriend. I am on a never-ending quest to save my girlfriend. <laughs> But even Xander had more personality than Galadriel. Unlike Galadriel, Freeran doesn't sit around on her rank or laurels. Even though she defeated a Morgoth-sized enemy and became the hero of the land, mm -hmm. Freeran isn't above helping villagers clean the beach or summon some flowers to make the garden look nice. But here's the cool thing. Freeran takes seven episodes to finally introduce a real threat, and many viewers who had fun watching this quirky elf will be taken aback by the change in tone and Freeran's behavior. <laughs> Yeah, bro, like, because the thing is, in this show, like, she basically does nothing for, like, the majority of the whole show. And then, like, she just sees this one dude with horns on, and she, like, immediately squares up with him, like, just on sight. Yeah, kill on sight, yeah. Mistress Freerin. Demons approach. As the audience, we don't even need to know the backstory between mm -hmm. Freerin and demons yet. The shift in her character is enough to indicate how she feels about them and lets us infer what may have happened in the past. This part of the story is also where Freerin and Galadriel are the most similar. Both elves hate the main monsters that they battle, and they execute them without remorse. Yep. Let's talk this through! Got him. Surprisingly enough, Galadriel is actually the more merciful between the two elves, as she has concerns over what her pursuit of vengeance is turning her into. Before I drive my dagger well, into- It's also the, uh, th there's a degree of kind of, there's a- the comparison, the juxtaposition of, you know, how thoughtful and emotional and, you know, like, I, I think thoughtful is probably the, the best word, that, like, all of the rest of the actions in the show are, whereas whenever it's a demon, well, you just fucking kill demons, that's it. Yeah, why? Because they're demons, that's what they do. All they do is lie and kill people, and so you have to kill them before they kill you. And it's like, there's a certain level of, a uh, fucking... Uh, like simplicity to that that I, I think kind of is is shocking right from that point in the show poison heart I will whisper in your piket ear that all your offspring are dead and the scourge of your kind ends with you it would seem I'm not the only elf alive that's being transformed by darkness it's not a bad idea, and if executed well, I'd actually have to give a point to Rings of Power for this one. And so so no Freerin, Freerin remains as cold as ever when confronted by demons. Yep. She's not conflicted by her actions at all. <laughs> and they wouldn't do that. Like, the thing is... I, I don't think that they would do that in a Western show. It was a God tier moment. Yeah, it was. So, like, this is a bit of a spoiler, right? I mean, I think the whole fucking the whole video has been a spoiler. But basically, uh, this girl thinks that she's more powerful than Freerin. She has this thing that will mind control you if you're the weaker of the two people to do the bidding of the more powerful one. It turns out Freerin's more powerful, so she gets to tell this demon girl what to do. And she straight up tells the girl to kill herself. She puts the sword up to her throat, and she fucking kills herself. That's it! And while the show gives us good reason to hate demons too, you can't help but feel sorry for them. Mommy, please. On one hand, it makes fear and appear like a badass demon slayer. On the other, I'm concerned that the show will not have any stakes or threats coming from the demon side anymore. Well, also, um... Like, I, I remember when... Whenever they, like, they, they, there's, like, that story of, like, the demon kid. 
And like the reasoning, I forgot exactly what it was. I have to think about it for a minute. But I remember like the reasoning that the demon kid had for killing the family that he was around. Uh, yeah, that's the, the meme from Twitter. Uh, there it is. Yeah, the reasoning that the demon kid had from killing the family that, that they were around. It made sense in like a really fucked up way. Right? It wasn't like, oh, we're just evil for the sake of being evil. It was like a really distorted, fucked up sense of logic. And yes, you can say that's also no fear. Replacement for the daughter she ate? Yeah, yeah. Is not solely about slaying demons, but I do want to see a bit more conflict there too. In terms of who did it better, I'm pretty sure you can all agree that Freerian has the upper hand. The anime just gives so much more details about the characters, their personalities, their little quirks. It's something that the Rings of Power should have really done with Galadriel. Yeah. They desperately need to flesh her out more and strengthen her relationship with Finrod. But the Rings of Power is not just about Galadriel. There's a ton of side characters and side plots that ultimately take away screen time from Galadriel. And unfortunately, none of those stories provide any value to the Tolkien fan. But if you like Lord of the Rings and you're willing to give anime a shot, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised by what So So No Fearin can offer. Thank you guys for watching. I'm sorry I had to re-upload this video again. Hopefully it meets their transformative standards yeah, now. This was really if you want good. to stay updated, make sure to subscribe, follow me on Twitter, or join my Discord page. The links are in the description. So hopefully I'll see you there. Yeah, I think this was really good. I hadn't had a chance to watch this, so I'm glad that I finally did. Yeah, that was great, man. Uh, I really liked it a lot. Demons are basically xenomorph that evolved to look and talk like uh, people to make hunting easier. Yeah, I know. There's lots of boring, stoic male characters, too. Gladriel's just a boring, stoic character. Men don't like it whenever women are stoic. Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's true. They'd rather the cute girl like an anime. Um... I think that, like, men are looking for something different in a female character than what they look for in a male character. Like, if you had the character of Galadriel, you could have written her character completely and had it been a guy, and it would have been the exact same. Freeman is literally stoic. Yeah, she's very stoic. I, I think that's it. It's like the aggression and, like, all that kind of stuff, too. It's not just the stoicism. Guys on sympathetic women characters. Uh, in some cases, yeah, there's a the video right there. Give it a like. This was good. No one likes boring shit characters. All the famous uh, male stoic characters have more going on with them than just monotony. The chatter's just brain dead. Well, I think that also, like, some people do like, like, very basic level characters. Like, for example, Master Chief is a good example of this. Master Chief in Halo 1 and 2. You don't really need to know fucking anything about Master Chief, right? Like, there's nothing that he's doing. He's just going in there. It's like, there's some aliens. We're going to kill the fucking aliens. And then after we kill the aliens, we're going to go back. We're going to kill more of them after that. That's it. And so you definitely have that. It, it's totally like a thing, and it's, it's good. But like, again, males look for things in male characters that they don't look for in female characters. Because... For a lot of guys, being stoic like that is something that they aspire to be like. But that's not necessarily something that they're looking for in a girl. I mean, I, I, I feel like, I feel like I'm explaining uh, just common sense. I mean, I'm like, I, I feel like, I feel like a crazy person saying this. But I also feel like I'm the only person who's not crazy. This is common sense. Yeah, exactly. Even uh, that example is a case of benevolence and selflessness. Yeah, yeah. Like Master Chief is never rude to anybody. He's never disrespectful to anybody. You know, he's all, like even like the uh, the soldiers and everything, people that are like way below him. He's never disrespectful, never talks down to anybody, anything like that. Barely even speaks. Yeah, I only somewhat agree. Look at Ripley from Alien. She's a phenomenal stoic badass lead. What matters is how the character is presented. Yeah, it's just not a like. I think the Galadriel in uh, Rings of Power is just not a likable character. As I said, yeah, Sauron was supposed to be a deceiver and, and likable, but man, like, you have a problem whenever Sauron is more likable than Galadriel, though. Like, that's a real problem. Like, that's <laughs> what the fuck, right? That's a big problem. Ripley, it was not stoic. Yeah, I, I'd have to, like, I haven't seen Alien probably in 20 years, so I don't remember that well. Writing sucks, doesn't make logical sense. Yeah, there you go. But yeah, this is the video. This is a great video. Uh, I was glad I watched this.